Hi everyone, I am Srihari. I work at this place called uh, Nilenso. Uh, we are a hackers collective based here in Bangalore. We are structured as a cooperative. We tend to like, write a lot of functional uh, programming in general, but we do a bunch of closure. Um, so uh, I'm going to give um, or share my experience in writing generative tests um, and share the process in which uh, I've gone about automating um, uh, the testing software as and when I've written them. <coughs> I've had the opportunity to work on a few systems that are substantially large and the test software for those systems that are uh, also substantially large compared to what you'd see generally. Um, I'm just going to share that. So um, I'm breaking down the talk into these parts. The bulk of the talk will be in the patterns, but there is a lot of uh, ground to set up before that. <coughs> so I'll talk about why, and, uh, why I'm giving this talk and what this talk is. I'll give you a practical system that we can hold on to for the rest of the talk so that we can look at all examples with respect to that. Um, I'll talk about benefits and problems of generative tests in general, uh, establish some ground terminology, and then the patterns themselves I'll split into four parts um, with the four phases of testing, and I'll delve into those. Um, so quickly, why am I giving this talk? Tests are good. I'm hoping that people in this room agree, generally. Um, there is a large part of the software world that uh, does not agree or does not write many tests. Um, I'm hoping that's not us. Um, we should be writing a lot of tests, but we don't. That's the truth. Um, so what do we do when we don't write enough tests? We automate it, right? Um, the flip side of, uh, you know, a QA engineer walks into a bar, orders one, orders minus one, orders infinity, etc., is that machines are better at doing this. John Hughes uh, made the case for this a long time ago. Quick check is in 30 odd languages now. Um, I'm sure we are all familiar with that. Uh, people here have written some quick check before? Yeah, at least familiar with the idea. Um, yet, um, people don't write them often enough, even generative tests. Uh, when I go around asking people, okay, you've done some quick check, what have you written? And the common answer is, well, I've had some unit tests and I've like generatively tested them, unit like function type things. I've had some data structure algorithms and like, I've generatively tested those. Um, but often people get stuck in thinking about what are the right properties to test beyond that? How do, how do I think about the right properties for my system, right? Um, it's easy to think about like circular buffers and sorting algorithms, but what about uh, someone logging in or authentication, right? Those are real. Those are the real systems that you build on a day-to-day -day basis, systems with side effects. Talking to a database, a third party, this is the kind of software that most people write on a day-to-day -day basis. And how does generative testing apply here, if at all? So, um, that's what this talk is about. Uh, that's why I'm giving this talk. And the premise of the talk is going to be automation. So we don't write tests because we are lazy. We don't write generative tests because we are lazy. Or maybe we don't know how to, but probably because we are lazy. So what do we do about it? We automate. Um, the interesting thing here is that um, the unlike regular software that involves automation of uh, um, domain and processes that are tangible, what we need to automate here is us. We are the people that are writing tests, and if we want to automate that, we need to automate us in the process of writing tests or our thought processes while we write tests. So that's interesting, and in that same vein, um, what I would think would be a takeaway would be um, the process in which um, the automation happens here, as it's subject to humans writing tests. So in terms of setting a, a common base so that all of us are thinking of um, a system when we are looking at all the examples, here's one. 
<coughs> consider a very simple generic e-commerce system. I'm sure everyone here has used Amazon or Flipkart or something of that like. Uh, and this is that. So you have um, operations related to the user cart and payment. A user can uh, sign up or be created. They can authenticate or log in. I can add a payment instrument. You can uh, find information about the user. The cart, uh, in the cart you can add things, update things, you can delete things. Uh, you can get the cart and you can pay for your cart. You can ask for a refund. Uh, you can apply an offer and you can get a receipt. Right? And um, to visualize this a little more, think of a simple flow that you sign up and then you log in. You add a card as a payment card, a credit card or something. And then you add something to your card. And then you update the quantity and then you pay for it. Right? A simple flow. Um, and this is the sort of thing that I'd like to test. And how do you go about doing this? Um, before that again, in terms of setting the right platform, um, what are the benefits and problems with generative tests? Let's try to understand that before we solve it, or try to solve it. The benefits are that it's supposedly better at humans, um, better than humans at input generation. Uh, this is largely true. To the extent that it's not true, it's because um, it's not as domain aware as it's supposed to be. Humans are better at it because they have context. They can talk to people and figure out what should be the case and what should not be. Um, and unless we tell the machine that, it doesn't know, and it's mostly just going to be a spew of random input. Um, and the other benefit is you can write maybe a dozen examples uh, by hand, example-based tests. Um, but with generative tests, you're thinking hundreds or um, th thousands. So more tests generally gives you a feeling that you have more coverage, which gives you a feeling that your software is somewhat more tested, or you feel more confident of putting your software in front of the users. Um, and ultimately, that's the benefit of all tests, which is you finding bugs in your software before your users get hit by it. So these are the benefits. but. Again, the premise is, why don't people write generative tests often enough? Uh, so one of the first problems is inertia. Um, and there are a lot of other people that have done a really good job in speaking about this. John Hughes, of course, has given a lot of talks, um, specifically with respect to closure. Uh, there's Gary Fredericks. Uh, he maintains the test check library here. And he's done a fantastic job of giving some uh, ideas about how to build custom generators and such. The other problem with generative tests is thinking in properties. Uh, not only does it take uh, quite a bit of um, practice in, in trying to think about your system in properties and not examples, but it's, it's hard even after you get there. Um, so like I said earlier, circular buffers, sorting algorithms, you've got it. All the examples, all the textbooks have that. You know how to do that. But how do you write uh, a property for login or authenticate or adding something to the database. Uh, these things are stateful. And most software systems are CRUD. How do you test CRUD generatively and effectively? The other problem is, and I've done this a bunch of times, I've like, put generative tests in CI. And you know the moment you put it in CI, it's going to go from 30 seconds to 2 minutes. And then the moment you add one more, just one more generative test with 1,000 cases, it's 5 minutes. And then before you know it, it's, it's 10, 20, 50. It grows exponentially, right? And I've seen people um, lowering down the number of tests that they run because it's slow on CI. And um, the sad part about that is that I actually don't care about 80% of the tests that run on CI at that point. I actually only care about the 20% of the tests. It's not relevant. For example, if I'm adding 1,000 items to a cart and purchasing it, sure, I understand it's an edge case. It's probably something my system won't handle. My system is probably more equipped to handle 10 or 12. Sure, I will have some overflow cases when it gets to 1,000, but I don't care about that as much. I don't need to fix that in production today. Um, so it's that the time spent on CI, even if a lot, is not relevant enough. It's not spent in a useful manner. And the notion that more tests give more coverage is flawed, because you can write 1,000 tests that go and hit the same happy path, and you don't know. Um, that it has captured all the paths. And to do that, you need to write tests 
that are written to hit all those parts. And you need to write your tests to be aware enough to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Which brings us on to this other part, which is in order to write those, uh, that logic into your test, you need to be good at it, right? Writing real code is hard enough. I'm going to write code that tests this code. That's, going to, that's even harder, right? And in, in practice, what I've seen is um, this ends up needing um, one or two senior engineers full time sitting on your generative test platform or uh, your test engine and ensuring that it's running all the time, especially so if you have it running on CI. Uh, it's brittle and it fails and it, something fails and it's very hard to debug, all that jazz. And um, your software changes, and this is often the case, and your tests need to change. Um, so every time something changes there, you need to go say, change something in your test in order to keep up with it. And that takes time and effort. Um, and another big issue that people don't talk about as much is what happens after you get a failure. With an example test, you know exactly what your input was uh, through a unit test or something. And you know it gets uh, more and more complex as you um, look at higher levels of testing at an integration test or a system level test. There are more inputs, more complexity to handle. And at some point, if there's an error or an exception thrown somewhere, you have to know all the context to get to that. And that is difficult, especially so with generative tests. Because um, if you are doing things like simulation testing, for example, which is just generative testing at a system level, you'll end up um, trawling through logs of multiple services to get where you want to understand what was the issue. That's hard. Um, and at that level where you're writing tests against stateful systems, your tests are not going to be deterministic. And you might even find it hard to reproduce. If it fails on CI, how do I ensure that I get the same failing case on my machine and run it and reproduce it and then I can debug it? That's hard. <coughs> Excuse me. And you need tools to uh, uh, debug. And so to get to the root cause takes time without the right tools. So these are the problems uh, that I've seen, I've faced. And uh, each time I've come across these, I've done one or the other thing to like make my life a little easier. Um, so terminology. I think about tests in three segments. Um, so these are not mutually exclusive. So every test can be in a particular phase, test at a given level, and have a certain focus of testing. Um, so phase, uh, you might be familiar with the arrange act assert or the assume arrange act assert. But I think uh, for generative testing, what is more applicable is uh, generation of input execution of your tests, assertion, and then diagnosis. People often leave out diagnosis. I do want to consider that as a part of uh, the process that I want to automate, considering it's us humans that are doing the diagnosis. Need to do something there. And the second thing is the level. So this is the uh, classic test pyramid, famous or infamous. Um, the understanding is that uh, higher up you go in the pyramid, if you're writing system level, system level tests, it has more value because you're testing from a user's point of view. Um, and lower down, it's easier to write. Uh, higher up, it's harder to write. It's probably more brittle. And lower down, uh, you, you have things like regression and whatnot. But they also run very fast. And the system level uh, tests run somewhat slow. Um, <coughs> in the spirit of um, questioning this as our testing paradigm changes from manual tests to generative tests, why not write more system tests? Because um, what's stopping us there? If, if system tests weren't so brittle, and if they weren't so hard to write, why wouldn't you be writing them more? And extending that to a little bit of a fantasy, why not write only system level tests? If you could write system level tests and had the right tools to diagnose the root cause at all times, you would always test from the user's point of view. Because that's the one that you care about, right? Your system can change over time, over years, with all the abstractions in between changing. But that doesn't matter as long as your test suite passes. And that should be from a user's point of view. This is a little fantastical, right? We are, we are not there right now. But you know, I think we should strive to get there. And I think it's not out of the limits. It's automation. The other thing that uh, I've gotten wrong with generative tests in the past is focus. 
So people think, oh, there's a lot of tests. Now I can use that for doing performance testing. So there's load testing, stress testing, endurance testing, and whatnot. And there's correctness, right, which is uh, a range of inputs that uh, hit your system in a particular way in order to find out if I'm doing the right thing. And there's regression, which is, uh, I hope I've not changed anything in my software that makes it not work for a case it was working with before. Now these three are different notions and different focuses. And often with generative tests, we try to do more than a single thing at the same time. And I have found that to be a bit of a mistake. I think generative tests can be all of these three things, but not at the same time. So you can have a CI test, CI test that runs a few uh, flows as a smoke test. But then the same thing, you can have it continuously running in another instance on uh, your staging environment or something for days together. And then you have your um, endurance tests and your performance tests and stress tests. <coughs> um, more abstractions. So the system under test is a, a commonly used acronym. But I want to think about um, the system under test the entire system or a, 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 a few microservices or um, a few namespaces or a few modules or a single function, all of these things, I want to think of it as a single unit, which is a function, right? If you can think of your entire system or a group of your systems as a single function, stateful function, then you have an input and you have an output and you have some state. So for a single function, your input is an argument and your output is a return value. Uh, at an HTTP level for your system, you have a HTTP request and response, right? And then, and then you have state. Um, here, I, I am mushing uh, third parties, your database, um, and all the I.O. that you do, all into this notion of state, right? And these are the three things that we need to understand to, um, understand and automate to automate testing this system. And um, since I'm conflating multiple notions into this function here, I'm going to call it an action. Right? Um, so this is what I want to test. It's the action. <coughs> and the archetypes that I want to automate are these two. One is ourselves, the people that write tests uh, or generative tests. And the other persona that I want to automate is a QA engineer, which is think of the domain knowledge that they have when uh, they uh, perform a certain test or uh, give certain inputs. <coughs> With that, patterns. Um, and the customary slide, which I'm sure the non-closure audience here won't get. But what I'm doing here essentially is taking all the notions of a software pattern and throwing out the door. And I'm saying that, uh, because all that comes with a lot of baggage. Um, by patterns, what I mean here is, I've done this a few times before, and I've seen uh, these things emerge. And I think it's worth calling these out, because, well, I think that's a lot of what humans do, which is recognize patterns. But maybe together, a bunch of these patterns can mean something bigger, which is usually the case if you're getting to something um, more uh, simple and profound at the end. So uh, patterns. And I'm going to split uh, the patterns into the four um, phases that I had before. So generation, execution, assertion, and diagnosis. So delving into the patterns first is uh, generations. <coughs> there are five patterns. I just dig into them. So first thing is uh, derive a parameter specification. Your test should know um, what are the arguments and the return type of your function, which to all the people here that write um, a type language, good job, right? Uh, you've got this under control. Um, but for the people that don't, uh, if you're writing um, either Clojure or Erlang or Elixir or something, then this is something that you can do. Uh, Clojure has this specification library called Clojure Spec or Prismatic Schema that you can use to type uh, or specify the arguments and the return value of your function. And you can write it as metadata. And here's an example of how I do it in Clojure and say, uh, these things are non-empty strings. This might be a nil. And you need a valid email here, et cetera. Um, and the interesting thing, even for um, people that write type languages, is that um, 
this lets me strengthen my types or tighten my types inside the tests, which is useful in generating input. So that's the flip side of this, which is uh, now that I know what I need to pass into my function, I can generate it. So um, this is what test check gives us, right? And we can leverage it. So we have a prismatic schema or um, a spec, a closure spec that gives us this. Sometimes we might need to write some generators. So uh, how does the language know how to create a valid email? You tell it. But chances are for a large system, you're gonna have to write a dozen of these and that's about it. You don't have to write a lot of these. And once you've written it, that probably won't change much either. <coughs> and I want to get to this point where I'm saying, um, by the way, I'm writing all this for the uh, action that is user create. So I'm using a namespace keyword here, which is user slash create. And what I want to be able to do is this. I want to say, assert that user create has no errors. And I want the rest of it to be automated. And it's not much of an ask, right? Because I, can, I know how to generate the parameters for this. I know how to run this. And how do I know if it's not an error? Well, depending on the function, you say that there's no exception, or it returns only a success response, or there's no timeout here. Right? That's fairly simple. And this is a very simple example of uh, what you can do when you know your parameter specification. Um, and this is uh, from where it gets a little more interesting. So how do you know what to run before you run the function under test or the action under test, which is the arrange portion of your test, if you're familiar with that arrange act um, search. Uh, acronym. So you need to run a few things in order to run your test, right? How do you know what that is? Chances are it's another action. So um, my proposition is uh, we express those dependencies using a DAG. And it's as simple as this. Uh, so let me take a few examples. Um, user create has no dependencies. But if I have to add an item into the cart, so which is cart add item, then the user needs to be authenticated, right? So that's a dependency there. So add item depends on authenticate. Another example is payment pay depends on add cart and add item. I'll take questions towards the end. I probably am going to go over 45, 40 minutes anyway. So um, yeah, so payment pay depends on add cart and add item. And add cart in turn depends on other things as well. So it's transitive, right? So Given an action, I know what are all the other actions I need to execute before this. So now what I can do is make a list of all the actions and say, ensure that there are no errors in any of the actions before. Because I know what all needs to be done in order to run an action. Right? So this, is, this helps automate the arrange phase. <coughs> Excuse me. So now that I've um, automated some of the parts before running the test, before running the action on the test, what about what I'm going to test after this? What, what happens after I run this? Um, so if you remember the original flow I'd written where someone signs in, um, sign up, signs up, logs in, adds something to a card, makes the payment, I want to model that so that I can test that entire thing. And we can model that using a probability matrix. And it's as simple as this. So user create, um, what I'm saying in that first line is that the chances that authenticate happens after user create is 90%. So 90% of the time after user create, pick authenticate. So someone um, you know, logs in after they sign up. And that happens 90% of the time, 10% of the time, it's any other action, as long as it's with, it, as long as it follows the dependencies that we saw before. So another thing is in add item, right? 30% uh, of the time after adding one item, the user adds another item. 10% of the time they update it, 20% of the time they remove it, and then 20% of the time they pay, right? And the rest of the time, whatever. The interesting things here are that zero and 100 are special cases. So zero means that this should not happen. 
the probability of this to that should not happen. In 100 means that, uh, say for example, in a system where um, you combine the notion of uh, sign up and login, and as soon as you sign up, you log in, then um, the probability of that should be 100%. So you can model that. And this is really interesting because it lets you model user behavior. So uh, consider infrequent users, right? The chances that infrequent users' sessions time out is high. And you know that you've had issues like that in production. You want to model that. You can do that here by specifying the amount of time uh, that a user will spend outside and then model their probabilities moving through the actions. Another example might be uh, modeling some of your user archetypes. So uh, for example, if you have um, a, a rich user's flow, right? Like, um, and say that 50% uh, of your users are rich users and they never ask for a refund or they always have enough money in their card to make a payment. You can model that, right? You can say that the refund is a zero and whatnot. Um, and this is often the case because uh, this in, in, on the systems in which I've worked, there are an archetype of two or three customers. You categorize your customers and say, this is this kind of customer, and this is the other kind of customer, and there are like three types of them. And you can model those three types and make your tests more relevant. So the 40 minutes you spend on CI, it'll be worth it. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, this is an example of what this looks like. Um, so it generated a list of actions to run. So here in the first one, the user is uh, signs up, they authenticate, add items, whatever, and apply the offer, and then they do a cancel. So this was generated, but you can see that you know if you're writing an example tests, what are the chances you do all this and they do a cancel in the end? On the second example. Um, uh, as soon as they add an item, they do an offer. They add an offer, and then to after the end, they do an up update item, right? Like that's also interesting. It's it's normal to see all these things in generated flows. That's what I'm calling out. And uh, note that um, this is not just a list of actions. Actually, I've um, made it brief here. It's actually a list of the actions and the parameters that we need in order to make that call. Together, what this makes is a specification for testing my action, right? Note that all this is data. Um, another thing that you can do here in order to make uh, your tests more relevant is make some of it deterministic. Um, a big part of diagnosing uh, some of the issues with uh, generated tests or simulation tests is that um, a lot of values are just random. You don't know what's going on. Deterministic seed data gives you a certain ground to work with. So I can say that um, create this user, um, log him in, and add a card, and that much I know has to work, and these are the values for all those three things. Test the flows from there. Right? And that gives me a lot of base. So I know that uh, this person, for example, has $1,000 in their account no matter what the rest of the tests do. So I'm good. Right? So that gives you a certain part of your tests that won't fail, so that you can focus on other parts that do. Or a certain part of your flow will work, and the other part of your flow you can concentrate on. So this also gives you determinism, and it simplifies debugging. <coughs> one other thing that is uh, non-obvious, um, and this is one of those things that you'll understand when you um, start writing tests outside of your system, which is you'll have to model a domain that's not modeled in your actual software. So for example, um, uh, we had to uh, model the inventory of supply. Actually, better example is money in a user's card. Um, so half the users, I want to say, they only have $50, and my average purchase, purchase is like 75 or something. And I can model that, but uh, and I, I can actually write uh, tests that generate that money and put that in the card, but I'd rather model it because what I'm doing on this side of um, the, the software when I'm testing it is I want to be like the user, and so I have to model the user. And the user is never modeled in the real software. Or a, um, another example could be a supplier, right? If, if I'm Amazon, um, I don't need to know how much inventory the supplier has, but if I am writing some logic that tests some of that, and I want to emulate the supplier, then I need to model the supplier on this side. And that really helps. 
So that's for generation. Uh, and note that all of the, these patterns are going to be forward and backward referencing because, um, I mean, it's not really, co it's not going to be cohesive. These are patterns that um, might have code in one place but have an effect somewhere else. Right, so execution. So we spoke about this action earlier. Um, so there's an input and an output. But um, what's really going on there is a little more. Uh, so each action has a life cycle. And speaking of forward references, I'd like for you all to take a leap here and, um, and, and, and just hear me out for a couple of minutes before you get to why I'm saying this. Store everything. Your test should store um, the request, the response, and the state at all points in time immutably. This gives your tests a lot of power because you can then introspect your test while running it and you know the state that your system was in and your test was in at any point in time even afterwards. This helps you report your tests better and diagnose it better. So let me give you an example, but before going into um, why or how it helps, um, here's how I implement it. So I use Datascript. Are people familiar with Datomic, Datascript, heard of it? So what it is is a um, uh, in-memory database, Datascript, but it gives me a data log query engine. So uh, what I'm saying here, well, this is not the query part, this is the storage part. So I'm storing some metadata, which is that this is the flow, this is the action, which is this user is doing this thing, and um, I'm storing the request, the response, and the state of all the entities related to this action uh, immutably. And this is the kind of thing I can do with it. So I can say, uh, and this is the data log query, I'll explain it. Uh, what I mean here is, uh, give me the items um, or the SKUs, really, that was involved in this flow. So for this, given this flow ID, give me all the SKUs. That's what this thing says. Um, another thing is, um, how do I know the parameters uh, I'm going to use in the next uh, thing, uh, next step? Uh, just one second. Yeah. Um, or rather, what were the parameters I used to make this request? I can look that up by saying, for this flow ID, uh, given that it was a request, give me everything. Right? And another thing I can do is, since I'm the test engine, or I'm, from a, I'm doing all this from a test engine's point of view, I know everything that I have done. And so I can actually give you a timeline of all the things that, are hap that have happened in the flow, which is super useful. In a test, you're often looking at logs that are telling you what's happening, except here it's data, and you can dig in to each point and tell what was the request, what was the response here, when was the error, and you can walk back and forth. Right? So given this flow ID and given this user ID, give me everything, sorted by time. Um, so there's another part here that I glossed over which uh, I'm hoping some of you caught, which was the magic of um, how is it that from one action to another action, you preserve state? Or if I created a user named ABC, how do I log in with user ABC? How, does this, how is this automated? Uh, and the answer is rather uh, stupid, but simple, which is the good ones. Um, I'll call out the flaws with this, but the point is just take the latest one. So if, um, uh, with this example, pick the no latest notion of a username that appears in your state. So if I created a, bunch, uh, a user and logged in and did some things, but then I logged in with the other name, pick that latest one and do the rest of it. It's heuristic, but it's a really good one. Um, yeah. So how this works is it's this part of that cycle where you take the generated params, you mush the state params in, and then you call your action. Right. So you have a generation, except during execution there is some state that needs to go needs to be ingested in in order to make the action. And uh, like all things, when they are very well automated, you need some ways to manipulate that automation. 
so that you can get some control over it. And uh, hooks are great for that. So in this case, uh, before making uh, the call to that action, I have a hook to say that, you know, especially when I am uh, creating users, um, prepend gen user hyphen in the name. Right? So generated values come across with the state machine in, and then I can, with this function, add another thing and pass it through because functions in first class and whatnot. And another example is um, to make a payment, I need a card, and without a card, I can't make the payment, but um, I can say for all the payments, use the default card, unless specified. And here in this params function, I have access to uh, the flow, the params, and the entire access to the state as of that time so that I can make that call accordingly. Right. So another thing that you'd run into is errors. Right. What do you do when you have an error? And more importantly, well, if you have a real error, well, it's a good thing, you found an error. Yay, that's what tests are supposed to do. Uh, now you go and fix it. Um, but what if you do it's an error that you know is going to happen? Like, Two, years, two users with the same name are being created. Well, yeah, I know it's going to be a duplicate user, but I don't want 80% of my tests on my CI to be this. And nor do I care about my CI reporting these bugs back to me, because I know it's a thing. So uh, this is a thing. Um, known errors are a thing. Recognize them and write them down deterministically. So with user create, duplicate user is a thing, with, uh, is a known exception. With uh, with paying, uh, an inactive session is a known exception or a payment complete. Like a, the payment is already done, now I'm paying again for it. I know this is going to happen, but <coughs> do you accept it that it has happened and it's okay for it to happen? No, right? Because when it does happen, you want to ensure that it happened for the right reason. You don't want to be throwing a du du duplicate user back when it's actually not a duplicate user. So when these things happen, you have enough control to verify that it actually happened. So I have a duplicate user. Great, now what do I do? Let me actually call the system and find out if there is a user like that. And then I say that it's all right, move on. Otherwise, I report it as an error. Uh, similarly, with payment complete, what I can do is I can look back at all the actions I've already made until now and tell if I've already made a payment call. So yeah, this is a duplicate one, I know it. Let's move on, right? And uh, a beautiful part of this is that you can absorb these known errors into your system Rather than have them in your test software, it's better to have them in your real software, and maybe even uh, you know um, uh, let them out to the users in, in, in terms of a specification, or even as an uh, error catalog somewhere so that you can return IDs and whatnot uh, throughout your software. It's a good thing. Um, and another beautiful thing here you can do is because we are in the you know business of automating tests and how we do tests is. You can abstract the request engine. So uh, imagine you're doing CRUD or something like that, and you have HTTP level requests, and you have uh, controller level requests, or something a little lower than that. You know, you have those three, four layers before it comes down to the model logic. Um, you can abstract that out. If you abstract that out, you can run all your tests at whatever level you want. Like that. Just switch the medium to, I don't want HTTP, I want controller, and then all the tests will run at a controller level. Because you know the parameters that each action needs to get, and you know how to automate that. If it's functions, great. If, if all your HTTP uh, calls and whatnot end with functions, and you know the types for those functions, you can just make function calls. <coughs> Excuse me. Think of this as a middleware in your test engine, right? That's really the pattern there. Uh, a hook in between your tests and your actual system that lets you change things, monitor things, and wrap things in, uh, or, or test a different part of the system based on what you give. So that's about execution. And then, uh, this is the part where uh, people get stuck often, which is assertion, right? How do I know what properties to use to test? Um, there are three things I'll go into. Um, Domain-based in based invariance is mostly that for completeness, but there's algebraic properties and there's state machines as properties. So algebraic properties. So there is five? I'm a 38 here, but yeah, I'll try. So there's um, no error, which is also there for completeness, but there is two columns. So uh, some of these tests are applicable at 
a unit single function level. Um, all the other things have something to do with order, which involves more than a single thing that you're testing. So there's uh, egality, ad importance, all, all of these things, and we'll let's go into each one of these things. It's no error. It's a very basic thing that you do that has a lot of value. Um, no exceptions. Your system should not have any exceptions at any point in time, right? Um, there should be no, and the kind of errors that you get out here are things like uh, overflow errors or um, out of bounds or, you know, your database um, uh, size limits and whatnot. And no timeouts. If you're writing a highly available system or a distributed system, you need to ensure that there are no timeouts. Or if there are, you need to look at them. And that it's always available. If you're running this as an um, endurance test on, on staging or something, this is really cool, really helpful. And then there's egality, which is effective equality. So for example, uh, sign up creates a user, but as a response, it does give the user back, and that's the same as user get. So if you do sign up and user get, you should get the same response. Both these calls don't leave the system in the same state that it was before, which is why it's effective equality. These are properties that you can still use to test. For example, um, an update item uh, with a deleted true, which is basically a soft delete, except executed as an update, is the same thing as a remove item. Right? So different parts, same result. Another big one is item potence. And uh, there are two classes of these um, item potence. So for example, login. Um, a user does log in and then logs in again immediately after. Do you write example tests for this? Probably not. And it's probably worth testing these things. Uh, payments, a refund and then refund again. It's useful testing that. Uh, but that's one kind uh, where you're calling the same action immediately after it. Uh, and this works for times when you have uh, other machines doing retries and whatnot on your system. Uh, but there's also the other kind where I log in, do a bunch of things, add items to cart, and then log in again. Because your system is in a different state at that point in time, you don't know if it will behave the same way. And item potence is super important in distributed systems and uh, critical systems like payment and uh, uh, health things and whatnot. Um, so as and when we add more things to automate, we need uh, knobs to ensure we're doing the right thing there. So. Uh, I have here a percentage of the flow that needs to have these item potent actions. So I take the existing flow and then I add actions in between to ensure that it's item potent. Um, and then I can take the same action and put it later on to ensure that they are distinct and I can choose what percentage of the times I want to do immediate and distinct. And in my system I had a blacklist of tasks uh, of actions that I know are not item potent. So I will not test those. But depending on your system you might have a white list instead. Uh, and then there's inverse, which is um, I do an add and remove, and it should leave the system in the same state, right? So this is the classic inverse, and um, assert equal here means that I do a cart get, I get the cart before I do both of these things, and then I add remove, and then I get the cart, and they should both be the same thing. And there's the normalized inverse version, which is pay, cancel, pay, should be the same as pay, right? And um, then there is commutativity, which is you don't care if things are in order. Uh, and this is crying automation, right? So you have uh, add one and two, and, and then two and one, and both of them should be the same thing. And even better, you can add some syntactic sugar around it and say that, um, you know, try these things in different orders. Even asserting that your operation is not commutative is a property. So take any of these earlier things, and if they're close enough, but they're not just as close, they're not equal. That's a property, that they're not commutative is useful. And then there's, of course, state machines. Um, state machines are great. You should model them in code where they make sense. And you should use those state machines in your tests as well. So uh, here's an example of uh, the state machine with uh, the cart. So uh, as soon as you log in, you have a new cart. And then you add item, it has items, and you cancel it. Uh, and you pay for it, it's a success. Or it's re refunded, and it's refunded. I can take this state machine and put it in a matcher. Right? This is a closure core match. 
uh, thing where I'm saying that uh, this was the previous state, and this was the item, uh, this was the action, and that was the result, and this is the new state. So these are all the valid state transitions that I can go through. Now I know all the carts and all the state transitions throughout my tests. So I can go back and then validate that there were no invalid state transactions, state uh, transitions. And this was great. Like it helped us uncover a few important bugs. <coughs> On that, oftentimes um, it's very interesting to see the results of this because um, the amount of effort you put in, you often expect uh, a certain amount of results. I'm, I've written this bunch of code, there's like 10 lines of code, and I'm expecting um, like one or two errors, but I end up getting 50 or 60. And that often throws you off, because whatever work that you should have done in a month is done in a day. And it's the flip side, it's a good thing, but it scares you. Um, Domain-based invariants here are here for completeness, but um, note that you have the, uh, the request response and the state to figure out what's going on, right? So uh, things you can do are things like, um, if I created 10 users and I do a user list, then that has 10 things. Uh, look up by ID, look up by name, look up active, all return the same thing. The number of items I sold are the same things as the number of items the customer bought, etc. And then there's patterns and diagnosis. Um, I'll quickly go through this, I seem to be running out of time. Um, your test is data at this point. All that I've had so far, uh, the action spec and the state, if I store it all, I can move it around. And at this point, that is my test. If, if I think of my test engine as a software, then this code is my test. And now it's data and I can throw it around. What that means for me is um, I can take something that runs on CI, make it spit out some data, copy that and run it locally and ensure that it reproduces the bug. I have reproducibility, one. Second thing is across versions. So if I run all my tests against v1 and it passes and I store that test, that test, that data that I have now is my regression test for v2, right? Uh, so this gives me both determinism and reproducibility, or rather determinism implies re reusability. Um, another thing is if you have like 100 flows or a lot of flows running, oftentimes you don't know where things failed, and it's really useful to think of your code as a, a tri data structure, where each move helps you navigate uh, to your error really fast. So one thing that has helped me a lot in the past has been checkpoints. So uh, after 10 things, you know uh, that like, you know there's been 100 flows, out of them this thing failed, this one flow failed, and in there I know that the user went up to add item to cart. So if the user has gone up to add item to cart, so I know that they have logged in, they have done a bunch of other things. And then I can diagnose the error from there on. So these domain-based checkpoints in, imply that I am telling the machine that these are things I care about. Right? That's the part where I'm automating my thought process into the software that I'm writing. Yeah, done. Uh, three or four more slides. Yeah, I, we can have questions outside, yeah. So one minute to wrap this up? Okay, so what I can then have is a timeline, um, and what I can do is each action is a UUID. Given the UUID, I can tell the request response and the stack trace, and here's an example of um, an issue that I filed on GitHub with the exact results of what I just showed earlier. Bug reports can be automated. Uh, this is just a summation of uh, all the patterns I have so far. Um, bottom line, automation is great. Uh, we should think of automating test software the same way we think of automating real software. The references are uh, Microsoft PEX patterns. They have, um, so there's parameterized unit tests in the ref shop, and they have written a framework called PEX around it. A lot of the algebraic pr um, patterns and stuff are from there. Um, they have very good material. The Datomic team has uh, the software called Simulant, uh, and they do a bunch of these things as well. So, and that code is pretty small, you can have a look there. And that's it. Thanks for your patience and thanks for listening.